I'm curious if there's people who come to you and they're very eager to do, to work through past lives with you and they experience a block. They have, res they notice some resistance or have difficulty going into those past lives. Yes, of course. Um, always we're going to have certain people who are going to go into trance or go into past lives easily and others who have that resistance. Um, and I have specific tools and techniques that I use to get over that resistance. But what I've noticed is when people, you know, maybe they're already excited, they've, you know, they've signed up for the session, they show up um, and they want to do it. But, you know, right in that moment, there's something that stops it. Oftentimes when we explore it, it has to do with either they're afraid they're going to find something that they did that they're not going to like, you know, what if I was a bad person? What if I did something really terrible? Um, and I talk to them about everybody does something terrible. You know, we all have something we regret, you know, and in some lifetimes, maybe more terrible than others, but it's better, it's better to explore that and resolve it than have that continue to be a part of your character that is maybe going to bubble up and, and express itself in some lifetime. You know, so even if it was something terrible, and I've had at least one client who um, recalled being a serial killer, and, you know, that is nothing in her character in this lifetime. Obviously, if she's doing past lives and is spiritual, that's not a part of her character. But yet there would be something maybe hidden in the recesses that could show up again. So when we do the healing around that um, and the understanding and the healing and everything, then we don't have to worry about it anymore. Most people don't have anything close to that, right? Yeah. Or they're afraid they're going to see something traumatic like, oh, I lost a child or, you know, I was abandoned or, you know, something like that. And again, if those things are in there, it's better to know those things about ourselves, right? To have that clarity and knowledge. Um, the other, the other issue that people have that you know makes them hesitant or resistant is they're afraid that by looking at either in hypnotherapy or in past life regression that they're going to see something that is going to require that they make a big change in their lives. Mm have to step up to some responsibility or get back on the path towards their purpose, um, you know, change jobs, get out of their marriage or whatever. And so even though they're coming to me or you or, you know, a hypnotherapist um, to have that, you know, they're afraid that, you know, maybe I'll actually get something <laughs> way too interesting. Absolutely. I think sometimes that's why the path for a lot of people, it's like they finally get to a place where they're ready to make that change because they've stepped into the courage of knowing the, the, the pain of not changing is greater than the risk of what will happen if you do Exactly. Change. They do that's need to recognize that that's so true. Yeah. yeah. Do you find, I know with with the work that I do with, with anxiety and habits in, in I do all current life work. Um, do you find that people associate into past lives in very different ways? For instance, you know, I explore how someone thinks about something. If I have different people who worry about the future, how are they processing it? Are they imagining something? Is there a narration? It's just getting a sense, that feeling. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if that those different ways of experiencing thought and experiencing memory is similar to different ways people experience past life regression? Um, it can be. Um, some people, it's, it's more like, well, if they're always in the thinking phase, I'm <laughs> left brain, <laughs> yeah. in the thinking phase, um, then they may have a little bit more difficulty getting into the imaginative side of flowing into a past life. So there may be, um, you know, some type of resistance just going there as well, just because they need to switch over and they're having difficulty with that. Um, but what we notice in past lives is 
you know, hopefully the, the experiences, they actually get into the body and are seeing the lifetime from those eyes, from the perspective of that person. But there are people who um, see it dissociated. So they're saying, okay, I'm sitting over there in a chair and I'm walking and I'm talking, you know, and they're seeing it from a distance. But I always explore that, that if they're, you know, if they're seeing it dissociated, I ask them, is that how you experience life here? And oftentimes that's true, mm. that, that they're, they're also dissociated here and they're kind of watching themselves walk through life. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure if that answered your I question. I think absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, that's, that's the sort of a related piece of through the, through their own eyes or the observing eyes. And I think sometimes I notice there are some folks who probably as a protective mechanism when thinking back on memories that are traumatic or hard to think of, some people create that sort of watching the scene, which is understandable. I yeah. know, so. Some distance. Yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting. Sometimes I, sometimes I do artificially dissociate them within the session in order to be able to observe a traumatic experience or a phobia. And we go through that several times until they become more comfortable with actually getting back into their bodies and, and going through it again, you know, doing it in the first person. Wonderful. But, yeah. I like that. Do you, what, what's a, what do you find is a common myth about the work you do? Is there something that comes up as a theme? I know you have a lot of great information on your website. Yeah. I'm just curious if there's things that come in that you're like, mm. um, you mean things that people believe like about past lives that aren't true or no, more like assumptions of what they're expecting with a session, oh. maybe with you. Oh, you yeah. know, because I mean, we have the, there's sometimes the people who have that well, I saw a, a hypnotist at my high school graduation, or oh. they're having expectations that don't match necessarily what they're going to experience with me. Or, you know, yeah. the myths is that the movies paint of exactly. being out of control, right? That we know that they're in full control the entire time. Right. I'm curious. I mean, it may be, just be similar themes, but I'm curious if there's anything that you notice sometimes people need a little right well I mean we probably both share that one where they're looking or they're assuming it'll be like stage hypnosis where there's the control and I'm going to be clucking like a chicken or something so yeah we have to get that out of the way with uh, with many people yeah. um, with past lives a lot of times people are expecting the um IMAX Dolby surround sound experience, right? They <laughs> yeah. just think they're going to drop in and they're going to be like in virtual reality and, um, and be able to go through it that way. And it, oftentimes it's not. Um, some people are able to do that. And even I am in awe of those people. They just, their imagination and their ability to plunge in totally viscerally um, is just really ad admirable for me, at least. Um, but oftentimes the experience is going to be more like a flash of a picture and then maybe a little movie that does roll, you know, that, that they're, you know, moving through and then maybe a flash to something else and then maybe some feelings. If people are very kinesthetic rather than visual, it may be really based on feelings first that like they get a sense of something and then they have to translate it mm -hmm. um and so then they they think well maybe I'm just not doing this right or it's not working and it isn't that it's just that they need to train themselves um or it would benefit them to train themselves to be able to be more visual you know to take the those feelings because we have those modalities that we're we're taking the information in with and recalling, you know, visual, kinesthetic, auditory. Um, and if they're very kinesthetic, they, you know, they'll just say, well, I'm not getting anything. So we have to really work on them paying attention to the feelings that they're mm -hmm. having and then allow those to be translated and, 
and draw up the pictures. Well, the other thing to answer your question is uh, some people come in and they say, I'm not visual or I have no imagination and I'm not visual. And that's not true, yeah. you know, because you have to use imagination for us to even have this conversation. You know, there'd be no way we would be understanding each other if we weren't kind of drawing pictures or, or you know, using our imagination involved with that. But um, so there's little exercises I take them through to, to demonstrate that they actually have both imagination and vision. I love that. And it sounds like you find that that people can generally practice and enhance their ability to visualize as any skill, sort of as a as a muscle, as they would learning to play the violin or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's actually very important for their soul to be able to do that because that is how we communicate with our subconscious mind is through imagination and visualization. It's also going to be how we communicate with spirit guides, or it might be, you know, seeing past lives. But also, when we die, we're going to have to use all these extrasensory perceptions because we don't have a physical body. We don't have ears and nerves to feel things or eyes to see things. So, all of that sensory perception between lives is going to count on imagination, being able to translate that, being able to see it at a different level. So a lot of the work that I do, um, I'm hoping also translates into my clients being able to navigate that period of existence um, better, right? Being, being more capable. So what do, you, what do you specialize? How do you, what, what are your specialties? Um, what challenges do you come up with in your practice? Yeah, so I, I, mo I mostly specialize in what I call thought habits. We, we think of habits generally as behaviors, right? And I, I work with behaviors such as stop smoking, nail biting, changing relationships with food, and all, all the work I do, um, to be clear, is, is current life. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I, I love being able to have the experts in the past life to direct people to who are looking for that. The, so we have this idea of habits around behavior, but we don't think about we don't always think about thoughts as habits. And so I work in thought habits as far as anxiety, worrying less, ruminating over thoughts, changing negative self-talk, mm. allowing people. When I, before I found hypnosis, before I found hypnotherapy as where really my home is, as far as you know, a practitioner, I was struggling and trying to find where I wanted to land and what I wanted to do. And I, I didn't, I struggled finding the job. What is the job title? What's the next thing I want to be doing? Cause I came from right. a, a different field at that time. And I realized, why don't I step back? And I stepped back instead of saying, what's the job? I said, what do I really want at the end of this life? What do I want to look mm -hmm. back and say, not tangibly what I did, but what do I know? I did. Right. And I created this mission statement for myself. I said, I want to help people be kinder to themselves, kinder to other people and more content. Awesome. And I, I used to say happy, but I think happiness has a whole lot of baggage around it, especially in our culture. And contentment is really where that wonderful foundation we can create. So I love, I love the, that smile, you know, that look on people's face when they come back for maybe a second session and they've had a week of so much relief yes. and so much difference. I am very tool-based, technique-based. I give my clients after every session, different methods that huh. are really could be classified as self-hypnosis, but it's just yes. ways of playing, right? It's visualization for people who are most comfortable in that. It's ways of interrupting thought. It's ways of moving our body to calm our nervous system. And I hope for a future where some of these things that we know and we in integrate into our daily lives work so well. I, I hope for a future where kids get to learn that. You get to learn that in first, second grade to, to be able to notice, oh, it's so much better to name my feeling and to notice it and to be able to say, what is this teaching me? Or what am I believing right now? You know, it's, but 
there's never, there's never too late for it. You know, it's, it's so exciting. And I don't, it does not matter if you have an hour or two left of this life or, you know, 20, 20 years left or more. The, it's really, I mean, I imagine you probably have a place in your life you can look back to and see that sort of shift for yourself as well. Is that true? The shift from, from, from being able to, that sort of realization that you have, we have more ability to, oh, to control. interact and change how it is we're perceiving the world, oh. how it is we're feeling, how we're being in the world. Absolutely. Know. And it's so important. And I agree. Um, teaching kids these things early instead of waiting till people are in their 50s, you know, same with past life regression or you know, communicating with the spirits and things like that, kids come in with that, typically their intuition and their memories, they typically come in with that pretty clear, uh, clearly accessible, but then it's just, you know, shoved to the side. And then later in their adult years, they have to pay money to get back the, the, the skills and thought, you know, things that they were able to do as a child naturally. But the same with the negative thoughts, especially as we're growing up and, you know, there's bullies at school or, or, you know, shame things like, oh, I didn't get a good grade or, you know, and worse and, you know, things that are happening there or people that are, you know, saying, oh, you're a bad person or, um, or the way that we interpret that even. Mm -hmm. And then that negative self-talk starts in and um, really being able to corral that and change that is so important. I love the work that you're doing. Mm, thank you. It's yeah. pretty. It's pretty remarkable. It's pretty great. And I use everything that I teach. You know, it's it's a lot of the stuff that I use as far as techniques and and methods are thirty seconds, sixty seconds. You know, yeah. a lot of the people I work with are well, extra busy parents right now. But you know different people who are, who don't have as much time as they'd like to really, you know, sit and, and spend a few hours kind of in, in their Zen garden. You know, these are people who have these little moments, these little bite-sized moments, but we can do a whole lot in those sort of those liminal moments to be able to make all the rest of that time easier. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's just fun. You know, I think, I think it's, it's really lovely. I get a lot of joy out of how many people get that surprise and delight because they come in with the weight of the problem. And by the time most people find, look out for a hypnotherapist, they've probably tried a few different things, right? right. right. They've probably been down a few roads and they're exhausted and they're just really wanting to change. And to be able to have, be laughing and smiling with them and allowing that shift of, you know, letting that weight go and yeah. feeling progress. Not that, oh, we're just going to ignore this, put this aside, but like, we're going to step into it and, and change our perception and realize, oh, this thing that felt so massive and big and right in front of us, look what we can do. We can put it over here. We can look at it from this way. It's, I, I love, I love metaphor. I don't, I don't use specific metaphors. So there's, a, there's some people in our field, I think it's so cool, people who can do this, who tell stories. So yeah. they say, one, one time there was this man, right? And they, they, they tell this tale. And I don't, I don't know how to do that without being really, really kind of awkward. But in the work, we create, me and my client create a metaphor for the problem. And there's all sorts of things you can do that's fun because it's, it's creating a knowledge that who we are, our, our self, our soul, no matter what somebody wants to call it, but our self, because we can observe our thoughts, because we can mm -hmm. reflect on our feelings and our thoughts, we are more than those thoughts. You know, right. my, okay. my, my thing for myself, sometimes if I get into like a, a little dark little tunnel in my own mind, it's just saying, oh, my brain is having a thought. Look at that brain. It's, tr it's doing so many good things for me. And it just thinks this is going to give me something good. It just, it's trying to keep me safe. Look at this brain having a thought. You're right. That's a <laughs> right. That's so. a good one. And yeah. speaking of metaphor, I love it too. And 
um, early on in my career, I realized that the client already had the full metaphor that they needed in order to understand their issue and resolve it. And so I created and wrote about um, a technique that I named reverse metaphor. I wrote about it in my, my book. And um, so it was the first time that was published and I teach it in my courses now, but um, it's a, a method of allowing the client to go in and tell the story. And then we look at what the story means as it relates to their own life. And then if it, if it ends well, then that's great. But if, it, if the story you know, gets stuck or has a, a negative outcome or something, we can ask the subconscious mind to tell us either the same story again with a different ending or a different story that shows how to resolve the issue. And then we go through the story again, and then we translate again as to, okay, well, you know, maybe there was a crossroads at some point and you took one path and then we ended up in this bad place, but, you know, which was the trajectory of where they were going if they don't do anything different. But then they could take this other path and they could see how that unfolded. And then, you know, then we can determine, well, what is it you need to do in your life in order to be sure you're on that other path towards this new outcome? And so it's very, very powerful. And it's so fun for me because I don't have that much work to do. You know, it's just like, well, what happens next? You know, but I also get to hear these fantastic stories. And I think there's no way that I would have ever made up a story that was more perfect for that client than what came out of their own mind just now, right? Absolutely. Um, and what yeah. I'm hearing, and what I'm hearing in that too, kind of echoes what you were saying about purpose being your focus of the work and how important that is that, you know, the soul's purpose is to express that. And Oftentimes those, that subconscious mind just needs a little invitation and an awareness of my metaphor is maybe they thought it was a wall, but we get to show them, Ooh, it's a secret bookcase. Ooh, it's a secret right. door, this beautiful window. And yeah. once that's open, it's still their job to go through it. It's still up to them if they want to go through it, but it's it's creating that sort of safe container and the framework enough so that then they can play and really flourish. And that's so much more empowering from a client point of view to say, I am doing this, right? I had a client who came back who's been, you know, she's been smoking or vaping for like 19 years. And after the first session, she was just done. We were doing a second session to, you know, work on reinforcing that. And she comes in, you know, on Zoom on the session, she says, you are a magician. And I said, I laughed and I said, and then she kind of went on and I said, you know, she said it a little bit later. And I said, you know, I'm not a magician. You're the magician. Yeah. I'm just lucky to be invited to your magic show. Right. And that's really, that's, that's so, really the pleasure. That's really perfect. That's <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's cool. I know. I love this work. It's just, it's so gratifying, you know, to see the, see the clients coming in, like you said, coming in with their burdens, their confusion their contradictions, their stress, and then leaving, in my case, you know, more self-aware, maybe aware of past lives, um, getting, helping them getting on their, their purpose, their soul purpose, um, and, you know, really changing that, you know, transforming and, and allowing them to evolve. It's so wonderful. Mm. I'm curious if I want to go to Speaking of different routes, I'm like, want to go two different ways with what you just said. I'm curious if, and it may be that you've integrated this uh, subconsciously. You don't, maybe you don't do this consciously anymore, but I'm curious if there's any advice or things you found works for you for self-protection, for self-care as a practitioner that's working in this very, you know, emotionally charged field you know i know some people especially when they're starting out have challenges not carrying the the weight or that feeling from their client on with their day 
And I have a few things I, I turn to when I, when I consciously remember to do it, but I'm curious if there's anything, any, any thoughts you have around that? Um, well, for me, it, it comes down the, basically to a philosophy. And the philosophy is that the client has created their situation. It's their situation, their problem. And they are the ones that will need to undo it and with the understanding of how they created, so they don't want to do that again, you know, so that they can keep from doing it again. Um, but um, so my philosophy is that there's no reason for me to take on any of their emotion or stress because it's not mine. I have my own issues, right? <laughs> we all have our own yeah. things, my own karma, my own issues to work through. Um, and all of that. So I don't need theirs and they don't need me to take any because even if I took on some of that emotion um, and let it burden me, it's they're still going to have 100% of it. But now maybe I have 50% of it, but it didn't really help them at all. In fact, it would make me less, um, less present and less capable of holding that space. So um, this came up actually, as you know, I do trainings and I'm training hypnotherapists and past life regressionists. And one of the trainings, I was doing a, a demo session with one of the students while other students watched. And the student I was working on became very emotional and was, you know, talking about some really, you know, difficult things. And and some of the students in the in the class that were observing were getting, you know, connected to the emotions of that. But I stayed a powerful witness for that client and held this space for her to fall apart, mm -hmm. right? And so my philosophy is I need to be the strong pillar so that they can lean on me. If I start, you know, crumbling with them, then we're both in trouble. And at the end of the demo, one of the students said, how could you stay, you know, how could you keep from crying and, and being involved with that? And the student that I had worked on piped in and said, if she had connected with that and gotten emotional too, I would not, I would have had to feel like I'd have to take care of her and I'd have to, you know, bring that in. And I wouldn't have trusted her to be able to help me. But because she stayed solid, um, then I felt like I could just like fall into it and let it all out and without, you know, either harming someone else or without not having the support to do it. So, you know, so for me, it's, it's a philosophical question, but it's, like a deep belief, we talked about beliefs earlier, but um, it is a deep belief that that it doesn't do me any good. Now I have cried in a session. There, you know, there have been a couple times where, you know, I had to, <laughs> sure. you know, um, but you know, the idea is to just really stay strong for that. I don't take on the energy. So the other way I visualize it when I'm teaching my students, because a lot of them are very empathic and sympathetic, and I have that, but the my method of doing it I say it's like wine tasting for the people who wine taste and spit <laughs> so <laughs> I don't typically if it's a good wine I'm not spitting it out right but it's like oh, wine I love it. where yeah. you take it in and you you know you can take in the the emotion or maybe the physical pain so you know you know it's like oh I'm sensing that your knee is hurting or something you know this is all by taking it in but I take it in and I spit it out. It's not mine to keep, right? So I take it in just like you would anything, like a perfume, you take it in, but you don't wanna drown in it, right? You're Absolutely. not gonna absorb it or, or digest it. So um, yeah, so it's like wine tasting. So you take it in so that, I mean, that's how we observe things. That's how we become intuitive. That's how we can read other people. But if we were taking on all of the energy and emotion and pain of everybody around us, or even just our clients, but everybody around us, we wouldn't be able to go to the mall or a movie or 
a football game or anything because yeah. we'd be a mess. Absolutely. Yeah. So how do you do it? I mean, is that similar or what's your? Yeah. So my, I am, I am fortunate in that I have in my own life kind of found that balance of being very present, very understanding, empathetic, and being able to say, I can hold space for you. Yes. Because like your, like your student said, if, if somebody else starts having an emotional reaction and that person wants to, is a caretaker or feels embarrassed or wants to fix something, it disrupts everything. So I'm, I'm very fortunate in that I don't have to do a lot anymore. Um, part of that is that I used to take on way too many people's feelings and didn't have any idea. I mean, this was my teens, my twenties and oh, right. it, was a, it was a very, very messy time. And I actually created a lot of walls and now it's like, okay, let's turn these into some blinds and put them up at the, the <laughs> right levels. You know, it's like still letting the sun rays in, but not being blinded by it. Right. And, but you know, it's interesting. One of my, one of my, well, she started off as a mentor. I would definitely call her a friend and colleague now, Tracy Barrett Adams. She's awesome. Awesome practitioner. She taught me about this, this sort of zip up technique mm -hmm. and it's very visual, but you actually can use a physical component of kind of, kind of zipping up this sleeping bag. Right. Mm -hmm. And allowing yourself in that to imagine sort of like a, you know, a protective sphere. We do all sorts of of that sort of visualization, but it's just saying, oh, this is mine. And I'm going to, I'm going to stay cozy with this, protect this, but I can still be here still at all that I need in all that I need out. But it's just, I think there's something about that little ritual of just that, that zip. And maybe it's just a reminder of, I don't need to be in there. I don't need to carry it with, I don't need to take, like you said, me taking some of their their luggage, their baggage doesn't give them any less baggage. We just no. have way too many ba bags around right. us. So, no, so, you know, yeah. So a little protective sphere. I do notice too, um, that, that movement is very good, mm. um, where my body is. So if I notice I'm not, I'm maybe having a rougher time with, for me, the challenge is feeling sometimes very drained after some sessions. Oh, okay. Sometimes I feel very energized. Most of the time I just feel very good. Um, but sometimes I feel drained and I can't really predict when that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so if I notice, oh, we've been, we've been doing that a little bit more. I'll stand outside like next to my chair oh, and okay. I'll imagine that that chair has whatever I need, whatever properties or feelings or anything that I need to kind of take in to get back into that place where I can, oh, cool. where I can show up like I want to. And that's very helpful. And even it's interesting. There's, um, she's a child psychologist, um, Dr. Becky Kennedy, but she teaches people who are set about boundary setting to even just press their hand, like a very slow stop out from their chest and just saying, that's, that's yours. And it's not a, forceful it's not me it's just that's yours and I can do that mentally if I notice I'm really getting too stuck later in somebody else's something or if it's I feel like that lingering it's like I'm going to let their experience and it's not getting anything negative back it's just creating that sort of I don't know it, it feels different and I think that kinesthetic right. piece is really nice I get the little yeah. visual the little kinesthetic exactly. I think I think the the mode, the method really doesn't matter. It's taking that moment to recognize if mm -hmm. we're falling into that pattern and then choosing to do something different. Exactly. But I love this idea of a philosophy. And I think that is so much more, uh, that's just in this deeper level, right? Than these little practices because you're bringing that into all of your work. Right. That it's not your job to fix someone, right? Exactly. I think we see that a lot. I don't know if you see this a lot, but like with newer practitioners thinking that there's like this pass or fail, right? There's pass yeah. or fail with the experience. And I think there's absolutely things that we can notice. Oh, I need to level up here or here's what I would do different. We have to learn, but it's not our job. We can't, we can right. just show them the door, the window. We can't 
go through exactly. it for them. So. Yeah, I've yeah. had um, that come up with one of my students recently where they were panicked because they didn't fix something in a one hour session. You know, they didn't get their own, their feeling of what we needed to get accomplished at the end of an hour. And it's like, you can't control how fast some, some of my clients will take huge chunks and move fast forward through whatever we're working on. And others, other clients can only handle taking baby steps. And so if I have an artificial goal that I think that this client needs to reach at the end of a session, you know, that's, that's my stuff. That's not theirs. Right. And so we're going to move at the, at the speed of the client. And, and the issue that she had talked to me about, I, it, it escapes me at the moment, but I remember telling her that the issue involved really would be a two or three session issue anyway. And to, to think that you're going to get to that resolution in that first session, you know, is just going to be frustrating. Right. Um, Absolutely. So we have to take our, agendas out of the session and just be present for our people, for our clients. I'm going to have to close pretty soon because I have another yeah. call coming up, but this has been absolutely Thanks. delightful. I'm so happy to connect with you and have this conversation. Oh, same here. Same here. I'm, uh, I'm going to enjoy my next chance to do some wine tasting with a whole <laughs> new perspective. So I really appreciate, thank you so much for sharing sharing with me and it's, I, I look forward to our next time connecting. Let's do that.